today we will start with another topic that is endocrine system. Now the first endocrine gland we will study is thyroid, a very important topic, a lot of questions are asked. When we are dealing with thyroid, we will study about both the non-neoplastic thyroid lesions and then we will study about the thyroid neoplasms. Now whenever you are visualizing thyroid tissue, you take a thyroid tissue, you observe it under the microscope, what will you see? You will see the presence of an abundant thyroid follicles. So you see these thyroid follicles, these beautiful thyroid follicles which are filled with colloids. So number one, there is a colloid substance, pinkish substance present at the center and these follicles are lined with thyroid follicular epithelium which is which is cuboidal to low columnar in the inactive state whereas in the active state it is tall columnar. So this is the epithelial lining which contains which substance? It contains thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin is a past positive substance which acts as a precursor protein for the synthesis of active thyroid hormone. Right? So substance colloid in the center and follicular epithelial cells comprising of thyroglobulin which is a past positive precursor for the synthesis of thyroid hormones. Next we will see the hypothalamopituitary thyroid axis. That means the hypothalamus will release thyroid releasing hormone that will activate the pituitary and cause the release of TSH. Now what is important from pathology point of view that it is serum TSH levels which are the most sensitive screening tool, most sensitive screening tool for diagnosis of thyroid conditions is serum TSH, right? Now this TSH will cause the activation of G protein coupled receptors release of CAM that will cause the formation of thyroid hormone. So in a condition of hyperthyroidism what will happen to serum TSH levels? It will be low whereas in case of hypothyroidism your body will try and compensate and cause the increased release of serum TSH so that more and more thyroid hormones can be synthesized. So here serum TSH levels will be high. Now moving on to the next, when, whenever we are studying about the thyroid diseases, they can be due to hypothyroidism or it could be due to underlying hyperthyroidism. If I ask you what is the most common cause of hypothyroidism, it will be iodine deficiency. But if I ask you what is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in iodine sufficient areas, it will be an autoimmune disease that is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Right? So Hashimoto's thyroiditis is an autoimmune disorder which is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in areas which are sufficient with iodine right? and because it is an autoimmune disorder will it be associated with other autoimmune diseases? Yes, such as type 1 diabetes, SLE, right? Is there, will be there an association with HLA? Yes, there is an association with HLA, DR3 and DR5 associated with genetic polymorphisms in CTLA4 and PTPN22. So it leads to painless enlargement of thyroid, painless enlargement of thyroid common in middle aged females. So middle aged females number one because it is an autoimmune disease, number two associated with HLA, CTLA4 and PTPN22 which has an autoimmune basis of pathogenesis. Next, so this is the thyroid epithelium in case of any defect in the autoimmune mechanism that will lead to activation of CD8+. What are CD8 plus cells? These are cytotoxic T cells that will directly lead to cytotoxicity of these thyroid follicular epithelial cells or it could be due to the activation of T helper cells CD4 that will cause the release of uh, various cytokines such as interferon gamma and activation of macrophages and will lead to thyrocyte injury. It can also lead to the formation of various antibodies. These antibodies will be directed against these epithelial cells and that we will call as antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. So what is the basis of injury? It is the anti-thyroid antibodies which are formed by the plasma cells against the thyrocytes and that will lead to antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity. Now, as I told you, it is an autoimmune disorder, so there is a high risk with association of type 1 diabetes, SLE, myasthenia. Now, very important students, two important malignancies you need to remember in association with Hashimoto's are number one, NHL, which type of NHL? Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, extra nodal marginal zone B cell lymphoma. Then there is an increased risk of papillary carcinoma. So two important malignancies in association with Hashimoto's. Yes, extranodal marginal zone B cell lymphoma 
and papillary carcinoma. And what are the antibodies? You remember the pathogenesis that there are various antibodies formed that will cause the direct injury to the epithelial lining. What are these antibodies? Again, three important antibodies you need to remember. Anti-TPO, anti-thyroglobulin and anti-microsomal antibodies, right? Again, very important students. Yes, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the most common cause of thyroiditis in iodine sufficient areas. It is associated with HLA polymorphisms. Yes, it is associated with other autoimmune diseases. Then there are antibodies associated with pathogenesis. That is very important, anti-TPO, right? And there is an increased risk of two malignancies you need to remember. Yes, NHL, extranodal marginal zone B-cell lymphoma and increased risk of papillary carcinoma. Now, now comes the microscopic appearance. Very, very important students, microscopic appearance of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Very simple and very important, right? What you need to remember is the association with these lymphoid follicles. Do you see these large lymphoid follicles? Yes. With the paler germinal center, so are you able to recognize a lymphoid follicle with the central germinal center which is paler in appearance compared to the outer area, right? So these are the lymphoid follicles number one. Number two, aren't they attacking the thyroid follicular epithelium? Yes, here you cannot see any well visualized thyroid follicles. That means there is destruction of these thyroid follicles by the lymphoid follicles. So there is an atrophy of thyroid follicles number two. There is follicle destruction by these abandoned lymphoid follicles. Number three, you need to remember very important student that is Herthel cell change, which is the characteristic, right? And how do you appreciate this change? With the abandoned eosinophilic granular cytoplasm, which is also called as oncocytic metaplasia, and that is caused due to increased abandoned mitochondria, right? So, what do you need to remember? Atrophy of thyroid follicles, destruction of follicles with lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate and the oncocytic metaplastic change. Uh, of a 50-year-old female presented with thyroid swelling, right? On examination, the TSH levels are elevated. So, TSH levels will be elevated in which state? Yes, hypothyroidism. So, hypothyroid female with characteristic microscopic appearance with where the follicles are disrupted by these lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, your diagnosis will be Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, what will you see in a follicular carcinoma students? Abandoned micro follicles with the vascular and capsular invasion, very important. Vascular and capsular invasion are the characteristic that will help you differentiate it from a follicular adenoma, right? Graves disease, what will you see? You will see hyperplastic follicles with the typical papillary enfoldings, right? And scalloping of colloid. Medullary carcinoma, you will see the disruption of the underlying follicles with the spindle cells, with the lymphocytes, right? So that will be a completely different picture. And what will you see in Hashimoto's thyroiditis? Atrophy of thyroid follicles, destruction by lymphoblasmacytic infiltrate and oncocytic metaplasia. Next comes Graves disease, it is the cause of hyperthyroidism which is caused due to which antibody? Thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin. So this antibody as the name suggests will lead to stimulation of thyroid, right? So this type of antibody will bind to TSH receptor and will lead to increased action of TSH, stimulates adenyl cyclase and thus it will lead to increased release of thyroid hormone. So very important, what antibody is implicated in pathogenesis of Graves? It is TSI, thyroid stimulating immunoglobin. Because it is stimulating, you can remember, there will be stimulation of CAM, TSH, right? And finally, increased thyroid hormones, right? So, it is a state of hyperthyroidism. And what are two typical clinical appearances you often study in association with Graves? Yes, you must have studied endocrine system in detail in your medicine. Here, we are focusing on the pathogenesis and very important, the microscopic appearances, right? So, here it is infiltrative dermopathy, also called as pretibral myxedema an infiltrative ophthalmopathy which is caused due to accumulation of mucopolysaccharides in the retroorbital connective tissue. So, there will be infiltrative ophthalmopathy, typically staring gaze of the person along with infiltrative dermopathy in the form of pretibial myxedema, right? Now, microscopic appearance, again very important from the pathology aspect. What will you see under the microscopy in a typical Graves disease? Yes, there will be certain features such as 
hyperplastic follicles do you appreciate there is hyperplasia of follicles number one number two at many places there will be papillae like formation so how will you differentiate it from a papillary carcinoma yes students very important papillary carcinoma will typically show the nuclear features of malignancy whereas here they will show the benign nature right along with that do you see the scalloping of colloid this whitish appearance because the colloid is taking the space of the epithelial lining it will leave these whitish spaces which is called as the scalloping of colloid very important so number one there will be hyperplasia of follicles number two there will be papillary formation and number three there will be scalloping of colloid next is mng multinodular goiter as the name suggests you will see multiple nodules over the surface so are you able to appreciate multiple nodules over the surface of the thyroid which are of variable sizes even on microscopy are you able to see that the follicles are completely of variable size right so this is the multinodular goiter next so other forms of thyroiditis you need to remember students d corvin's thyroiditis is a painful enlargement of thyroid associated with viral infections and is usually a self limiting disease so what is an important feature you need to remember d corvin's is a painful enlargement of thyroid next sub acute thyroiditis is painless so you need to remember d corvin's is painful enlargement whereas sub acute is a painless enlargement of thyroid again self limiting here it is associated with pregnancy whereas d corvin's is associated with pre existing viral infections now sub acute lymphocytic thyroiditis are again characterized by abundant lymphoid follicles but how will you differentiate it from a case of hashimoto thyroiditis that there is no oncocytic or herthal cell change next is redel's thyroiditis right so here you can see stony hard fibrosis because of this hard fibrosis hard nature of the swelling it is often confused with malignancy so very important differential diagnosis and why is it important in order to diagnose redel thyroiditis because it simulates malignancy both clinically and right and on radiographically also so on microscopy what will you see you will see these dense areas of fibrosis are you able to see this dense fibrosis which is a feature of redel thyroiditis so tony hard fibrosis is a feature of redel thyroiditis it is a rare disorder which is often a manifestation of igg4 related disease so with this student we cover the non neoplastic thyroid lesions next we will take the thyroid neoplasms